Looking down through the ages, God beheld the dying soul. Sin had brought separation, never more could man be whole. There must come a lamb, one whose blood of gold redeems, bringing gifts to the Father of the soul. Wide and clean. When he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as worthy and not as I am. He views me in garments as white as the snow. For the Lamb of God is worthy. And he washed me the side low. So he left that holy city, traveling home to the cross, just to praise the gold to glory and to rescue all the lost. By his blood he entered into the throne room of our God. All the mercy salvation for us all. And when he sees me, he sees the blood of the Lamb. He sees me as worthy and not as And he washed me the side low. All right, if you have your Bibles tonight, and I trust you do because we're Bible readers and Bible studiers, I want you to turn to 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13. Thank God for the choir special. Thank God for the orchestra, the musicians. Uh, it's all part of the sermon tonight is that we need to realize why we sing what we sing, and how do we sing? I'll be open to this. If, uh, if we need to turn to contemporary music, and the Bible says that I'll do it. If the Bible says it's not appropriate, then I won't turn to it. Uh, I want to know if our music's appropriate, and I think God tells us exactly how we ought to play the instruments, and exactly the balance, and exactly the unity of the music, and uh, we're going to praise God with music. Amen? Uh, matter of fact, 2 Chronicles chapter uh, 5, verse 13, tells us about the unity of the music and um, the purpose of music in the house of God. And I want to read this verse, and we're going to uh, look back and review next uh, last week. Or last week I was preaching a, a missions revival. Pray for them as they receive it tonight. But um, I'll review just a little bit because some of you can't remember two weeks ago. Some of you can't remember two minutes ago, but, you know, two weeks ago is a long time. And I shouldn't have started the series, but I did. So we're going to get right into it. Uh, let's stand on the Word of God. Second Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13. Thank you for the song service, Brother Randy. It said, It came even to pass as the trumpeters and the singers were as one. Amen? Now, folks, I don't believe that means they were not bickering and fighting. I don't think our musicians or orchestra hate each other. Or anything, I'm not sure, I don't think so. But uh, folks, this one means in, in the harmony, and, the, and they're on the same page, and, and they, were, they were doing it where it was melodious. I believe that's what that means. I'll, we'll delve into it in just a minute. It says, and, and it came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were as one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. One sound in praising and thanking the Lord. And when they lifted up their voice with the trumpets and the cymbals and the instruments of music and praised the Lord, saying, For He is good, for His mercy endures forever, that then the house was filled with a cloud, even the house of the Lord. Now, according to my Bible and according to your Bible, music and unity and harmony and melodious music 
and Christ's army music brings the presence of God upon a service. Now, folks, I want to say this, I want to say it very clearly, is that it's not for entertainment. It's for exaltation. Music's meant not to entertain you. And I want to tell you something, a lot of people do not sing and they do not play because they're afraid they'll make a mistake. Folks, that is congregation focus. We need to do it for the Lord if we make a mistake. As a matter of fact, I hadn't heard somebody in this church make a mistake musically because I wouldn't know it if they did. But praise God, we ought to do it for the Lord. Praising God. And if you make a mistake, God forbid anybody laugh at you. Because God's not laughing because you did it for Him. So I want to preach this a few minutes on the characteristic of godly music and how we can praise God through singing and the music. Never preached a message on singing in my life, but I'm going to try it tonight. So you pray. You may be seated. Father, thank you for this great verse that tells us about the sounds of trumpets and cymbals in the house of God and praise of people saying, took a break during the hymn, took a break during the music, the orchestra took a break, stood to their feet probably and cried out, He's good! He's merciful. Amen. And the cloud filled the house of the Lord. God, thank you for that desire of heart of musicians that want the power of God and the presence of God to be so evident that they're not noticed in their little talent or their big talent or their beautiful talent. But God, it's all given to you for your glory. So Lord, help us to realize that you created music for a reason. And God, we ought to play music and sing to music for a very good reason. And that's to thank you and praise you with all our heart. In Jesus' name we pray. Teach us to be more thankful through this message. Amen. God created music. Music was given to man at the moment of creation, Job 38, 7. He surrounded himself with angelic choirs in heaven. The Bible says it very clearly in Revelation 14, verse 2 and 3, that there's a song of the redeemed. There's nobody singing, I hang down and held on and prayed through. It's all glory to the Lamb and blessed, blessed the Redeemer. Hey, friend, at the Christ's birth, the angels did what? Sing praises to God. Folks, I believe it's biblical. I believe it's scriptural. Last week, or the week before last, I talked about the clouds and the, and the stars singing, the sun, the moon, the wind, the hell, the hills, the trees, the beasts, the birds, the, fi the fish, the insects were urged to praise the Lord. Psalms 148, verse 7 through 10. Let's look at that. Psalms 148. I got to look at that. Did you say insects? Did you say hills? Did you say trees should be singing melodious to the Lord? Yes. Look at Psalms. And I want you to look at the last chapter of Psalms. If you don't believe in music in the house of God, throw your Bible out the door because I'm telling you, the book of Psalms is a song book. Amen? Selah. Pause. That's a, bit, that's a scriptural musical note. Pause and think about it. Alright, let's read Psalms 148. It says, Praise ye the Lord, praise ye the Lord from heavens, praise Him in the heights. Praise ye Him all His angels, praise Him all the hosts. Praise ye Him, sun and moon. Praise Him, all ye stars and light. Praise Him, ye heavens on heaven, and ye waters that be among the heavens. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for, the, for He commanded, and they were created. You ought to praise God you're alive tonight, amen? It says, for He hath also established them forever and ever. He hath made a decree which shall not pass. Praise the Lord from the earth, ye dragons, and all the deeps, fire and hell, snow and vapor, Stormy winds fulfilling His word, mountains and all hills, fruitful trees and all cedars, beasts and all cattle, creeping things and flying fowl, kings of the earth and all people, princesses and all judges of the earth, both young and maidens, old men and children. Let them praise the name of the Lord, for His name is a, a long excellent. His glory is above the earth and heaven. He also exalted the horn of His people, the praise of all His saints, even the children of Israel, 
a people near unto him, praise ye the Lord. Then he ends the psalm with this. He says in verse uh, chapter 150, Praise ye the Lord, praise God in the sanctuary. Sanctuary, set aside for God's praise. That's what this is. Praise Him in the ferment of His power. Praise Him for His mighty acts. Praise Him according to His excellent greatness. Praise Him with the sound of the trumpet. Praise Him with the pasadre and the harp. Praise Him with the tremble and the dance. Praise Him with the string instruments and the organs. Praise Him upon the loud cymbals. Praise Him upon the high sounding cymbals. Let everything that hath breath praise thee, Lord. Praise thee, ye the Lord. Now folks, it's scriptural to have music in the house of God. I don't care what Church of Christ preaches. Yes, I do. I don't, I don't see where they get it. Uh, my brother-in-law was a Church of Christ preacher, and I was amazed he didn't believe music in church, but every time I got in his car, I was hearing country music. I thought, wait a minute, whoa, 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 whoa. Didn't say it out loud because we fought all the time. Uh, I, I said, whoa, wait a minute. If you don't believe in music in the house of God, why do you believe in music in your car? I said it to myself. If you don't believe in music, you shouldn't believe in it all any, anywhere. Amen? But I want to tell you something, folks. I thank God for our musicians. I thank God for the organists. I thank God for the pianists. I thank God for the baritone uh, player, the, the flutes, the bass guitar left you out the other night. Alex, you got mad and left the church, but you came back. But I thank God for that, amen, that we have a bass guitar. I was scared about that because I thought we was going to be maybe too loud, but he plays it perfect. And uh, music was given to man at the moment of creation. Music, sun, pastors, valleys, singing. All things give God the glory, for there is a reason because He's glorious. One of the greatest gifts that God has given us is music. Can somebody in the orchestra say amen? Music. It's a gift. If you can play it, you ought to thank God for it. Amen? I wish I could play something. I'd just stop right now, go over there and just let her rip. Amen? If I was Jimmy Swaggart, I could do it. But I'm telling you, friend, it's a blessing. Music aids in the worship of God. Turn to Psalms 40, verse 3, please. Psalms chapter 40, verse 3. I think you ought to, I think you ought to play the instruments with a smile upon your face. Amen? I'm glad Brother Randy smiles up here. I've been in some churches, I'm telling you, they don't move the hand, they just sort of, you know, and then they look at you like they're mad you're here, and they hate your singing, and you hate them, it just kills the service. I've been in services where the pianist looks like she's mad at her husband all the time. I've been in services where the organist looks like she's mad at the deacons, and the deacons were mad at her. And I want to tell you something, friend, it kills the whole spirit of the whole place. I believe we ought to be happy in Jesus about everything we do, Amen. I'm not talking about shouting. I'm not talking about jumping pews. I couldn't get some of y'all to do that if I, if I paid you. But I want to tell you something. We ought to be happy. And we ought to be thankful that we got a talent that we can use for God. Amen. Amen. Look at Psalms chapter 40 verse 3. And he hath put a new song in my mouth, even praise unto, uh, unto our God. Many shall see it, fear, and shall trust in the Lord. Now folks, let me just outline last week's real quick. Music aids in the worship of God. Look at the first phrase. And he hath put a new song in my mouth. A new song is exactly this. It helps, it helps us praise God. A song. I love the songs. I love old-fashioned hymns. I don't understand how anybody could worship God without noticing the message of the song. Folks, the song is praise. The song is a prayer. The song exalts God. The songs teaches us biblical truths. Folks, we ought to understand the message. It should be a new song, but it should be a song of balance, of harmony, not letting the rhythm conquer the heart harmony and, and have it unbalanced and have it uh, in such syncopation that our heart beats and flutters when we hear the heavy metal uh, uh, spiritual music. Folks, God help us. I heard they come out with this new thing called spiritual rap. Now, can you imagine Brother Randy getting up right before I preach and start rapping? He ain't got enough hair for that, and he ain't got enough courage for that, amen? But I, just, and I ain't going to try to imitate it because I'd make a fool out of myself. I thought about trying to. But I, I don't think that's proper. I just don't think it's right. You can say whatever you want to, and you say I'm critical, but I don't care. We as human beings are God's crowning creation, and as children of God, we ought to join the angels even more so and praise Him with song. 
and the right kind of singing. I'm going to prove to you biblically what kind of music we ought to have in the house of God. I'm going to prove it biblically. Folks, we're to sing chapter 4. Um, uh, it's just so, so evident. Chapter 40, verse 3. We ought to sing even praise unto our God. It's an act of worship. Do you sing to be heard? Or do you sing, you don't sing because you hope nobody does hear you? Or do you sing to the Lord? We're to sing joyfully to the Lord and praise Him and make skillful music unto Him with instruments. Turn to Psalms 33, verse 2 and 3. Psalms 33, verse 2 and 3. I don't know how much I emphasized this a couple of weeks ago. I'm sorry I started the series and then broke it. I really am. But uh, if, you don't, if I don't remember, you probably don't either. But look at this. It says in verse 2, Praise the Lord with harp. That's a laid down harp over there. Amen. Singing to Him with a pasadre. That's what that is right there. And the instruments of ten strings. Singing to Him a new song. Play skillfully with a loud noise. Folks, that means we can sing loud. It does mean that we can play with praise. We don't have to be so shy about it that nobody knows we're around. The purpose of music, and still is, is to praise God. It was then, it is now. We need to pray for wisdom on how to appropriately and rightly praise God. There is a way to be decent and in order, not dead and decayed. Say amen. I think it's all right to be in theos, enthusiastic for God. So number one, we need to realize music aids in our worship. But number two, music teaches spiritual truth. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 31, verse 19. Deuteronomy 31, 19. Now therefore write ye, his, ye this song for you, and teach it to the children of Israel. Put it in their mouths, that this song may be a witness for me against the children of Israel. Folks, I'll tell you what, he said teach them a song with some biblical doctrine. And, and, and folks, it's easy to forget uh, the majesty and miraculous power of God. Children of Israel tried to forget it. But folks, if you'll memorize a song and sing it and praise God when you're down and out, when you don't want to come to church, when you sit there looking at a mule, looking at a new gate, uh, when Brother Randy's up here pumping away, they're playing their hearts out. If you'll just get in the song service, it'll help you to learn a biblical truth. I want to tell you something. Eternal security, every time I think about that, I think of Fanny J. Crosby when she wrote the song, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, and she didn't say, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is Mine, and I hope I don't lose it. Come on, Arminian, that's exactly what you believe. Folks, I want to tell you something, Fanny J. Crosby had right doctrine in that song. Right doctrine. It's a blessed assurance, I believe in eternal life. And folks, when you sing that, you ought to thank God for His mercy, thank God for His grace, and thank God you're saved and still will be saved, and saved to the day you bow before His throne and sing praises unto Him. That's biblical. Number three, music aids in edifying, strengthening, and encouraging one another with the Word of God. Colossians 3.16 says that we ought to sing the Word. And Ephesians 5.18 says we ought to sing with harmony. I'll get to that in just a minute. God places a great emphasis upon being filled with the Spirit. But right after he says filled with the Spirit in verse 18, look at Ephesians chapter 5. In verse 19, he says sing. I mean, as soon as he says be filled, he said sing. And if God says sing, we ought to sing. I look at some of y'all, y'all never sang one word in a song service in your life. You just look at Brother Randy like, mm-hmm. Praise God, that's his calling. No, that's your calling. I don't care if you can make a tune in a 10-gallon bucket or play, you play the radio and it gets static. God's called you to sing. God's called you to try to sing. Uh, Ephesians chapter 5, verse 18. Everybody's there but me, but I got to meddling. But look at this, Ephesians chapter 5 and verse 18. The Bible says this, be filled. That means be controlled by the Spirit of God. It says, be not drunk with wine, where in excess be you filled with the Spirit of God. Then it says, speaking to yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing and making melody in your heart to the Lord. It says, there it is. It says to yourself. You don't have to sing out loud. I want to tell you something, friend. It ought to break out once in a while on purpose. Amen? I mean, listen, if you don't sing anywhere else but the shower, you'll encourage the, the faucet. Say amen? Uh, you'll encourage your wife. She'll know you're alive in there. Amen? Thank God. Folks, listen. Without the Spirit's empowerment, our worship and our music is empty. 
It needs to be filled and controlled by the Spirit of God. Fourthly, I said this two weeks ago, music is a tool that consists in evangelizing the lost. Psalms 40 verse 3 says, it says, Many shall see it, fear and trust the Lord. Music is important if it causes people to get under Holy Ghost conviction. I was talking to the deacons this afternoon about thermostat control. That's deep in it. And I said, listen, I want to tell you something. People fall asleep. It just, it's contagious. Everybody looks at that guy and says, well, he's not interested. I won't be either. I think we ought to worship with some reaction. I don't believe we have to pipe it up, but I believe a nod of the head, a praise God, or even a holy yawn will help a preacher. Amen? But I want to tell you something. You put all five or six people to sleep, you feel like quitting and throwing in your ordination papers. We give an invitation and nobody moves, nobody comes to the altar. It discourages preachers. But you're not coming just to the altar to encourage me. You're coming to help others that maybe uh, come in here for the wrong reason. And they're just saying, hey, what is this all about? And they don't see you speak in tongues and call you some kind of mad person. 1 Corinthians chapter 14. They see you responding to the Word of God through singing and praising and using your talents using your smile, using your attention to get them involved. It's contagious. That's why I like circle auditoriums. Everybody sees each other. It's from heart to heart, and, it's, and it, it ministers one to another. Your singing ministers to other people. And folks, God's desire is His people be transformed in His image rather than being conformed to the world. And we're a called out assembly. And praise God, our music should reflect some great themes like redemption, Joy, sins forgiven, consecration, heaven, the attributes of God, Revelation chapter 5, verse 9 through 13. Our song should be directed towards God, even praise unto our God, Psalms 40, verse 3. Our song should display the public view that they may see it. Our song should design to attract others to salvation and fear and shall trust in the Lord. You know, there's a lot of people that say that music's amoral, that it doesn't affect you morally. Let me just prove you wrong for a second. Folks, I want to tell you something. When, when, when music notes are combined, they have a message. Just as when letters are combined, they form words and sentences, and a message is produced communicating a thought or emotion which has influenced the morality of the one who hears it. It's called language. And therefore, music most definitely is a moral issue. It is a universal language. I've been all over the world on mission trips, and I'm going to tell you something, friend. It's a language that people understand. I'll never forget in South Africa, minding my own business, they sing with some life. And I'm sitting there on the front row minding my proverbial business, trying to figure out which of the 20 messages on my heart that I'm going to get up and preach. And about that time, somebody goes, boom! I thought somebody hit me in the back of the head. I looked around. There was this lady smiling. She knew she shook me up. And uh, she had this pillow, a black pillow, of course, a black pillow. And praise God, it was about this big, about that long. It had a, had a handle on the back of it. I could slip, you know, slip it in there, you know, hold her hand. And I won't tell you what she was doing. She was keeping rhythm with that, whatever it was. And she, boom. It wasn't out of it wasn't out of order. They'd sway a little bit and boom. They'd sway a little bit more and boom. And, I, and then I got a hold of it. I said, Praise God, give me that pillow. I'll do it. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Ain't nothing wrong with a little life. There's nothing wrong with a little rhythm. As long as the rhythm doesn't drown out the melody of the song. Get to that in just a minute. Can't wait to preach on what kind of music we ought to have in the house of God. Therefore, music's most definitely a moral issue. It's a universal language going beyond verbal barriers. Influencing people regardless of what culture uh, uh, they're from, uh, what language they may actually speak. Music is a form of language. Music can communicate right or wrong messages. Just the music. Just like verbal language. Two notes together. I was going to get Miss Faith to get, sit on the front row and just pipe out one note. Boop! You know, That don't make much sense. But if she puts it together with five or six beautiful uh, notes, it's beautiful. It's music. And folks, it's... I've heard of people having music therapy. Amen. Over at YDC, they have dog therapy. They bring in pets. That's therapy. The old Fido's going to help this guy stop, you know, being so insecure. I'm for it. Praise God, whatever works, bring in Fido. Amen. And we're going to probably eliminate the preacher and bring in 
uh, uh, Fido and let him, let him bark a little while. That's fine. But I want to tell you something. There's something more than pet therapy. There's music therapy. Doctors are using it. I'm telling you what, restaurants use it. You ever went to a restaurant and they have mood music? They want you to stay there and order one more glass of wine. How many of you Baptists drink wine? Raise your hand. We'll kick you out of the church. But anyway, uh, 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 listen, listen. You know, they want you to stay around. Now, if you're in a fast food or you're at Six Flags Over Georgia, guess what kind of music they play? Fast moving. They want you out of there. Amen? They don't want you wassailing around on the screen machine. They want you through there. So they, they manipulate you through music. I said last week or week before last, TV commercials would be dull without music. You ever seen a kid, Thatcher ought to use you as an illustration. You ever seen a guy, a little kid walking through the den and all of a sudden a commercial comes on? They, they turn around, they start looking. I said, oh Lord, what are they doing? They're memorized, they're, me they're hypnotized. And folks, all of a sudden they're trying to buy that product. Why? Music caught their attention. Come on, say amen. By the way, have you ever been to a movie? I know I don't, you don't believe in it. I preach against it, but, you know, we can't be perfect. You ever been to a movie? You went to that movie, and they never played an ounce of music in that movie. What would that movie be? Flop! Flat! Nothing! Praise God. They spend millions and millions and millions of dollars to put the music track onto the movie to produce what? A feeling. Excuse me. Emotion. That's a better word. Don't get up here and preach because I said that. But hey, it puts, it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a feeling. You ever been in a scary movie? I don't watch them, but my wife lets me slip up once when I watch them. That music starts getting intense. You know, man, I tell you what, I get scared, don't you? I look and see if my wife's watching. Because she don't allow that in the house, you know. And I'm backsliding. I'm watching one. And I'm going to tell you something. That music. And you're sitting there saying, what would it be without the music? It would be dull. It would be lifeless. I wouldn't watch it. Music. You say it's not important. Yes, it is important. It's very important. The Cubs, when they went into overtime, what do you call it? Extra innings. They said that... Uh, uh, Hayward, I almost said Duke. Jason Hayward. <laughs> you imagine him playing ball, brother Larry. But anyway, he probably can. But oh, Jason Hayward went in there and gave him a speech, and then they turned on the eye of the tiger. Dun, 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 dun. And they went out there, and they scored all kinds of runs. Why didn't they play that thing in the first inning, say amen? They got fired up over what? Music and what it represented. I'm just talking about the secular world. But I want to tell you something, friend. God has a lot to say about music in the spiritual world. Turn to Leviticus chapter 10, verse 10. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 10. I'm talking about thanksgiving with music. I'm talking about praising God with music. I thank God for our music. I don't want to change a thing, Brother Randy. I mean, you can sharpen it up and praise God. Don't quit choir practice. We need to be together. Amen. I'll prove that's biblical too. We need to be orchestrated. But we don't need to be dead. And if we do make a mistake, excuse us, we're just trying. But look at this. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 10. It ought to be done decently in order. I don't believe in a congregation just getting up in the choir and not rehearsing. I don't believe in that. You say, well, the old-fashioned church. I said, hey, we ain't no, we're old-fashioned, but we don't, we don't have to be out of sync. And everybody's singing a different song. Amen. What are we singing now? How many verses? Well, we'll find out before we get up there. Say amen. But look at this, Leviticus 10.10. 10. And that you may put difference between holy and unholy and between unclean and clean. Folks, there's holy music and there's unholy music. There's clean music and there's unclean music. And the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 16, Be ye holy as I am holy. God's position never changes and never will. And I want to tell you, friend, we ought to pick our music, we ought to sing our songs with this in mind. God is holy. Amen. Now, I'm going to talk to you about different styles of music. Some of y'all are really holding on to your banjo right now. think I'm going to condemn it. No, I'm not. I'm talking about you can have holy banjo music. So I don't believe in that. 
Well, don't be so prejudiced. We, we Southerners can be hillbillies if we want to, say amen. But I don't believe we ought to slide notes up here with steel guitar. Come on, you musicians, back me up a little bit up here on the front row, amen? Am I right or wrong? I don't believe we ought to slide notes. Go to the bar and hear that. No, don't go to the bar, please. Please don't put that on the air. But that's where you hear that kind of stuff, amen? And you say, oh, you're against country. I'm not against country music. Some of y'all are so country, you'll not sing any other way. And that's, that's you. And that's the style. There's different types of music, but there's a right way and a wrong way to sing it. Say amen. Jeremiah 6, 16 says, well, to ask for the old pass. But that don't mean we have to throw the piano out the door and sing a cappella every verse. Folks, we need not compromise. If we start compromising in the ministry of music, we'll compromise in other ways, like doctrine. Folks, holiness matters. Turn to Psalms 96, verse 6. I believe we ought to have holiness, but not holier than thou music. Psalms 96, 6. I marked so many scriptures, I can't find any of them. Boy, you ought to have the pressure of preaching sometimes. It's wonderful. Amen. Psalms 96, 6. I preached 8,000 messages from this pulpit. I figured it up. 8,000. And I'm still nervous when I preach. Will you ever not be nervous? That's my question. But I guess it's good to be nervous. Psalms 96 and verse 6 says, Honor and majesty are before him. Strength and beauty are in, this, in his sanctuary. There ought to be some strengthening music around here. And there ought to be some strengthening praise around here. And there ought to be in the sanctuary. Sanctified. You know what that means? This place is sanctified for godliness, not entertainment. Say amen. We don't eat in here. Some of you that eat in here, you're doing wrong. You don't eat in the house of God. The janitor's already complained to me five or six times, and I know where you sit and I know who's doing it. Put up the chips and put away the popcorn. This is worship time. Say amen. Woo, I made somebody mad right now. They're not even looking up at me. Amen. Folks, this is not entertainment time. We're not, to, we're not here to clip our fingernails. I mean, I've seen piles of fingernails in the floor while I'm preaching. I said, why did they have time to do that? They ought to bite them off, amen? Praise God. <laughs> hey! Leave the clippers at home. This is sanctuary. This is sanctified. This is not an auditorium where we're auditioning. I got rebuked by that by Stenet Blue calling this place an auditorium. He did it in a nice way. Praise God, that's fine. Because I know how they worship down the road, say amen. I'm preaching there next week. Y'all come on down. But I want to tell you something, friend. Verse 9 tells us how we ought to sing. Oh, worship the Lord in the beauty of what? Holiness. Fear before Him all the earth. You know how we ought to sing? As if Jesus is standing here hearing. And I want to tell you something, friend. There's where the entertainment has got to stop. That's where the jamming has got to stop. That's where the high-powered electric guitars with the smoke coming up from the, uh, from the floor and people jumping up down and, and, and half-naked and immodest has got to stop. You say, you're too old-fashioned. I'm going to the local contemporary church. Well, I'm going to say this. I'm going to say it clearly. You'll be making a mistake. Because worship is should be done decently and in order, and there's holiness, and holiness is based on three things. God's position and God's precepts. That's how we ought to sing. Now, let me just close by saying this and saying it clearly. What is the characteristics of godly music? What is the characteristic of godly music. Well, 2 Corinthians 5, 13, 2 Chronicles, excuse me, 2 Chronicles 5, 13, that I just read tell us, tells us how the music ought to be played. What kind of music we ought to choose, Brother Randy. What we ought to do with music in the house of God. 2 Chronicles chapter 5, verse 13, and it says, It came even to pass as the trumpeters and singers were in one to make one sound to be heard in praising and thanking the Lord. One sound. 
one sound. Everything should be done to honor God. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Every time you put in a CD in your, in your uh, car, by the way, it ought to honor God. Every time you scroll through the iPod, put on those headphones where nobody can hear you, it ought to glorify God. You ought to ask this question before you ever listen to a song and before you ever try to sing one, before you ever try to play one. Will this make Jesus happy? Will this please God? Well, we do that for everything else. Why shouldn't we do it with music? We're to walk in the Spirit, not the flesh. Galatians 5, 16. My flesh likes fast music. My flesh responds to that kind of music. I was raised as a manager of a rock and roll group. My best friend was Billy Collins. He was the best guitar player. And I want to tell you something. We grew, we grew up with the Bee Gees, the Monkees, and the Beatles. And let me just say how carnal we were. And the Beach Boys. Bob, Bob, around. Sure. Come on. Come on now. Amen. We grew up with that junk. Amen. I didn't think it was that bad. Compared to today, probably it. But I want to tell you something, friend. It didn't glorify God. It glorified those jaybirds on a surfing board. <laughs> Amen. We thought they were heroes. We thought the Beatles, I mean, you think Trump caused riots. You ought to see what the Beatles did. Girls taking their clothes off, going over fences. And, and all they were singing was, she loves me, yeah, yeah, yeah. It wasn't, the mu it wasn't the lyrics, it was the music. Rock and roll music. Elvis Presley did more damage to this country than anybody I know. Boy, some of y'all just roll over in your, on your pew then, praise God. You ain't going to cut my Elvis, because he did sing Amazing Grace. You know. <laughs> Amen. Come on now. But he, that's not all he sung. That's not all he promoted. But I bet we'll just give one song on Saturday night on the rock and roll concert. He's spiritual. It doesn't make Johnny Cash spiritual, and it doesn't make Elvis spiritual. But boy, we lift them up as heroes, and we make them millionaires. Folks, we're to exercise spiritual discernment, and that spiritual discernment picks out what's best. Philippians 1.10 in spiritual song service, God is in, interested in the excellency, yes. He's interested in the exaltation, yes. But He's not interested in entertainment. He's not interested in that. God help the local church that has entertainers up here. Now my wife's got mad and leaving. But entertainers here instead of exalters. I'd rather have an old boy that sing off key and didn't do too good a job that exalted lords and some rock and roll expert get up here and entertain you and everybody wants his autograph instead of wanting to get a preacher to sign their Bible. We ain't got room for celebrities in this place. We need servants. Amen. He said, this ain't too good a Thanksgiving message. I'm going home. Just a minute. Our music should have unity, number one. Chaos, disorder, and confusion are characteristics of the world's music. How many know that for a fact? It's chaotic. It's disorderly. And it's confusing. If you don't agree, I want to challenge you to do this, and you'll, you'll probably do it anyway. I want you to turn to a rock and roll station, heavy metal station, and I want you to blast it as loud as you can on the way home. And I want you to see if it glorifies and, con and, and confirms this message tonight. I mean, I believe we ought to be able to pray the lyrics of godly songs to the Lord. I believe we ought to rehearse them. I believe we ought to, that's what the Bible says we ought to do. We ought to review and rehearse and sing as the song of Moses. These characteristics should never be present in Christian music. God has created and ordained for things to be done decently, in order, 1 Corinthians 14, verse 33, verse 40. Everything should be done decently and in order. Everything we do, say, and wear, and listen to, and play, and sing, it reflects the holiness and order of a heavenly God. Our music should not be chaotic with loud disarray or even with obnoxious overdriving beat. 
mean, it's not even in rhythm with your heart. It steals away from the melody. Our music should be aimed at praising God. Music is a medium for worship. It ought to be melodious. That's what 1 Ephesians 5, 19 says. It says singing spiritual psalms and hymns. Making melody in your heart. Folks, it's wrong, it's wrong to bring the world's music in the house of God. Don't borderline it. Thank God for old-fashioned music. It brings an old-fashioned conviction, an old-fashioned air of, of worship. I still think we don't need a new version of Amazing Grace. I still think we don't need rock and roll music to Amazing Grace. I just don't think we need it. I still like Rock of Ages. Left for me. I still like the old-fashioned way. That don't mean that we can't have an orchestra. It doesn't mean that we can't have a guitar. It doesn't mean that we can't uh, sing some songs with a banjo or guitar. That's different styles of music. I'm not getting into that. We can direct our music as worship. Turn to Revelation 5, verse 8 through 14. 5, 18 through 13, it's 805. Somebody change that clock. Look at Revelation. What we're going to do in heaven? What kind of music is going to be in heaven? Let me just ask you a question. I don't mean to be crass and I don't mean to be critical. And I try not to get into these debates, but it, it just disturbs me. Do you think there's going to actually be rock and roll concerts next to the streets of Go? And before we go to the throne, we're going to stop and have a little, have a little, hit, uh, have a little concert? You think that's the kind of music we're going to have up there? You think actually we're going to have somebody beating the drums to death, and I mean uh, electric guitars going, and I mean uh, just, just loud, no, no, no melody, just the rhythm and the beat dominating, not even caring what the, what the message is. You think that's going to be in heaven? I just can't get that picture. Now, if you think it's in heaven, see me after the service and we'll, we'll, we'll rap about it, but I'm telling you, I just don't see it. Chapter 5, verse 8, here's the music of heaven. When he had taken the book and the four beasts and the four and twenty elders fell down before the Lamb, having every one of them harps and golden vials full of odors, which are the prayers of the saints. Look at verse 9. And they sang, they sung, excuse me, a new song saying, Thou art worthy to take the book and to open the seals thereof, for thou wast slain and hast redeemed us to God. They're singing this by the blood. I like the songs with the blood. Out of every kindred and tongue and people and nation has made us unto God's kings and priests and we shall reign on earth. Then it goes on to say, And I beheld and I heard the voice of many angels round about the throne and the beasts and the elders and the number of them were 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands of thousands saying with a loud voice, it's hard to be enthusiastic now, worthy, here's the song, is the Lamb that was slain to receive power and riches and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and blessing. And every creature which is in heaven and on the earth and under the earth and such as were in the sea and all that were in them heard I saying blessing and honor and glory and power be unto him that sitteth upon the throne and, and unto the Lamb forever and ever. And the four beasts said, Amen. They could understand the words. And the four and twenty elders fell down and worshipped him that liveth forever and ever. You just heard a song that's going to be sung in heaven. Does your music meet God's standard? Look at Psalms 29 verse 2 for God's standard for music. I just want you to sing to God when you sing. I want you to praise God. I want you to know that He's worthy of all thanksgiving in song. Psalms 29, verse 2. Given to the Lord the glory due to His name. Worship the Lord in the beauty of holiness. Holiness. So our music, number one, should be have unity. Unity, not chaos, not just a rhythm superseding the harmony, 
and the melody. Our, and I'll get to that in a minute, but our music should be joyful. Psalms 100 says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord. I don't believe that noise is racket. And I've heard a lot of people that can't sing, that think they can sing, and they use that verse to prove it. It says, make a joyful noise unto the Lord, and I'm just going to make a noise. Well, that's good. But you've got to be approved to make that noise around here, amen? That you're living what you're singing. And that you're faithful. And that you're not singing to somebody to hear your noise. But you're doing it for the Lord. I believe that noise is not racket. I believe it's giving it all you got. Excuse me. I shook them up on the second row there. It's singing with your heart and from your heart. There's nothing wrong with that. Entheos is good in the house of God. Enthusiasm. When we sing or play or, or just think on the message, we ought to sing with joy. I think it's biblical to put a smile on your face while you sing or play for the Lord. Amen. You're conveying a very encouraging message. And you know, I like it when musicians all of a sudden they get carried away and they start singing with the song. Ain't nothing wrong with that. Praise God. I mean, they can't contain themselves, Brother Randy. Woo! Amazing grace. Hallelujah. They just start singing. Not even supposed to sing. They're supposed to play, but they start singing. It's all right. We don't have to be dead around here, but we, did, we need to have decency and order. We need to give, give God the glory and convey with a very encouraging message. Even how we do it. Number four, our music should be joyful. Our music should be aimed at praising God. Revelation chapter 5, verse 18 through 14. Psalms 29, verse 2. But fourthly, our music should be properly ordered and balanced. Now here's, I'm getting into something that I don't know much about, but I know what I hear and I know how I feel when I hear the wrong kind of music in the house of God especially. It makes me sick. It disturbs me. It makes me wonder why we're here. There are three parts to music, the melody, the harmony, and the rhythm. The melody, the melody, melody feeds the spirit, melodious music, and I'll prove that scripturally. The harmony feeds the mind, and the rhythm feeds the body. God designs the melody to be the preeminent feature of music, according to Ephesians 5.19. Because the spirit is to be nurtured and cultivated, never the mind and body over the spirit. In other words, it's all right to tap your foot when you sing. Or hear singing. I like it. Praise God. I, I like, a lot of you don't like this, and you know, that's, that's different. Me and Jason differ on this. I like good old-fashioned gospel music. He's more upper class. He likes more of a cultured music. Praise God. That's good. But we don't fight about it, and we sure don't, you know, we don't play the same albums probably in the car, but I want to tell you this, friend. I like foot-tapping music, but I'm not listening to music just to tap my foot. Amen. Come on. I'm trying to let my heart get tapped into who God is. Amen. And there's different kind of music. I love it all. I like the anthems. I like the formal hymns. I love the hymns. And we're not going to get rid of the hymn book, even though we have that little thing on the screen. That's, a, that's one thing I almost didn't have screens because I'd afraid y'all throw the songbook out the back door because we're going to just sing courses all the time. No, I love hymns. Don't you? I love the old-fashioned hymns. Praise God. Onward Christian soldiers makes me march. But that's not the reason I listen to it. On the other hand, unbalanced of rhythm overtaking the melody is a song that nurtures the flesh and it's not biblically right. A song that features, at the, uh, f features the melody with accompanying harmony. It don't overpower power the medley. And the rhythm aids and supports the medley. That's the correct order and balance. Now, only musicians understand all that, but I guarantee you, friend, God ordained that the world's music, even contemporary Christian music, tend to have an unbalanced music. Boom, boom, you know, God help us. And it appeals to the flesh. It appeals to my flesh. But the world's music has a, 
has a rhythm that's so pronounced, so syncopated. I think that's a beat that's opposite of your heartbeat. It's not, it just doesn't make sense. It, it drives you to actual tension. You ever had a song you heard and it just... If I was a heavy metal musician, I would crash the guitar into the amp like who every time. Because I'd get so nervous. And we're... Bah! That don't belong in the house of God. Say amen. And it's getting in the houses of God. The fastest growing churches in America have uh, this kind of music. And folks, listen. I'm not trying to be critical, but I just want us to know what we've listened and why we've listened to it. And, and we're not changing as long as I'm pastor. As long as Brother Randy's a song leader. Make sure your music doesn't feed the flesh. It appeals to the body foremost. It's all right to tap your foot, but that's not the reason you sing, and that's not the reason you listen. But I know a whole bunch of people lately have come to me and said, listen, if we just had some more contemporary music, our church would sure grow faster. That breaks my heart. It makes me feel good. It moves me, some people say. Well, that's all good. But there's nothing wrong with liking music. But ask yourself this. Why do you like it? What's being appealed to? The spirit, the emotion, or the flesh? Here's the big, big question, though. It's not what you like. What does God like? Is, is it nourishing your spirit? God likes that. Is it nourishing your minds spiritually? He likes that. Or is it feeding the flesh? He doesn't like that. Because I'm going to tell you something, friend. If you get in the realm of the flesh, you can do some terrible things in the flesh. And I'll just be honest with you, I believe that's why a lot of churches are full of adultery. Because they're sensual in their music, they're sensual in their worship, they're sensual in their dress, and folks, there's a lot of sin going on congregation you didn't think I'd say that did you but it's the truth it's the gospel truth I think we ought to have music that convicts us to be more like Jesus I believe we ought to have music that brings our thoughts heavenly not down in the gutter and not sensual and not just have a feeling rock and roll music does that country music does that and you know it you don't listen just for the words. You like the feeling. You become a cowboy riding on a horse in the sunset all of a sudden. And the women are running after the horse and you. You become the long ranger all of a sudden. And you feel pretty pumped about it. Yeah. You get high on it. You get tough on it. You feel good about yourself. And rock and roll music, it makes you so sensual that you want to go out and sin. You say, I don't like what you're preaching about my music. It shouldn't be your music then. We're not going to have rock and roll music coming out of that corner right there. I can just see all of a sudden, so we're going to change the format tonight. We're going to have a little contemporary service. We're going to have rock and roll music with smoke coming up from the from the floor, and we're going to have uh, the, uh, the singers take off their shirts and put J-E-S-U-S -S on it, and we're going to jump up and down and scream and holler, and we're going to call that worship. You say, that's ridiculous, preacher. It's happening every Sunday in, in Whitfield County. It's taking over. The venue's taking over Chattanooga. And my good preacher friends are losing members right and left to this rock and roll climate. As believers, you've been chosen. You've been called out. You're special to God. You've been saved for a purpose. To show forth His praise. In closing, it's 17 after 8, I've got to close. Look at 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9. Talking about thanksgiving and praise tonight. I'll finish this music message later. 
I'll go home, the devil will jump me and say I was too rough, too straight, too blunt. He'll do, he'll do it. He does it every time I preach like this. You think it's easy to preach, you ought to try this thing. Because the devil will jump you time you get in the car. But I'm going to preach, thus saith the word. 1 Peter chapter 2, verse 9 says this, But you are a chosen generation. I want you to think about the area of your music. You're a royal priesthood. A holy nation. Now look at this. A peculiar people. Why do we need to fit in with the world? It's getting dark out there and we're letting the world come into church. That you should show forth. Let's just show forth the praise of Him who has called you out of the darkness into the marvelous light. Boy, what a blessing. Verse 10 says, which in times past were not a people, but are now the people of God. You were of the world before you got saved. Something changed. Even your appetites would have changed. It says this, which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lust, which war against the soul. The devil desires to get a stronghold in your flesh. And Brother Larry, am I not right? But you used to kill for your rock and roll music. You used to be defensive. You used to have stickers all over your doggone jacket and you'd fight every policeman in the book because you were so hooked on that junk. You was hooked on rock and roll music before you was hooked on drugs. Is that not right? He said amen. You didn't hear him, but he said it. And I want to tell you something. He can't stand it now. And if any of you ever get up here and it's close to rock and roll music, you offend this old boy big time because he knew he came out of that darkness. Come on, say amen. I didn't mean to put you on the spot, brother. They're going to hate you too. But anyway, no, they're not. This is a good church. Choose the best rather than settling for the acceptable. Raise your standard. Hey, friend, listen. When in doubt, don't. Come on. And I'll just say this right now, and I'm going to say it clearly. If you listen to junk music all your week, and you try to come in here and sing in the choir, or you try to come in here and hear this preacher and think you're going to get blessed, you won't. Because your mind is preoccupied. Your mind has got that junk in your mind. And I'm going to tell you something. When you try to pray, it'll start reverbing. Amen. I know what I'm talking about. I used to be a carnal worshiper. He said, I don't like that. I'm trying to help you worship God. And if you don't prepare your heart with godly music during the week, when you come in this place, it will not turn a switch. Matter of fact, you'll think it's quite boring and you'll find you a church where your music's there. Brother Alice, you used to play it. You used to be in one of those kind of churches. You could testify if you'd help me out on what it does to you, how it controls you, how you live for it. And by the way, I don't know how to say this, but I'm going to say it. If you have the right kind of music, it's going to be hard to pull out the drugs. If you have the right kind of music, it's going to be hard to get into bed with somebody else's wife. I can't believe I said that. Let me say it again. If you're listening to the right kind of music and have the right kind of mindset, I'm going to tell you something. You're not going to turn on amazing grace when you're about to commit adultery. Amen. But you're going to turn on something else. And you're going to set the mood for sin. Come on now. I know I'm not going to get popper through this message, but I'm going to tell you, you know it's the truth. Garbage in, garbage out. Wrong atmosphere, wrong territory, wrong foothold. The devil will use music more powerful than you ever could think. He, matter of fact, was the music director of heaven before he got kicked out, Brother Randy. I shouldn't have said your name after that sentence. Amen. This ain't the typical Thanksgiving message I dreamed of. Christ will take away your fleshly desires if you have a desire for the right kind of music. 
Last but not least, our music message should be clear in sound and not vague in terminology. Back to our text in Psalms 40, it should be clear. It should be easy listening music. Because I want to tell you something, friend. It's the music's not the important part. It's the person that's singing the message of God that's important. And I'll just say this. If those musicians are drowning him out, they're wrong. And when's the last time you've been to a contemporary church where they didn't drown out the message? I'm trying not to be vague and I'm not trying to be mean. But you ought to avoid loud drum beats, electric instruments that distract or cover up the words of precious songs. Avoid slipping around on the notes like a lot of southern gospel. Say amen right here, Jason. Southern gospel music does. It, it just is, you know, I don't think you ought to have a flat guitar. And then have a spiritual song with it. Excuse me. Because it distracts. You, your, your ears go to that music, that sliding on that note. Don't slide your notes. Combine your notes and melodiously play the notes. That's the right kind of music. Just beware of music clouding and drowning the message. Number six, last but not least. Did I say that last time? Okay, this is it. Our music should refresh the spirit. Turn to 1, Corinthians, 1 Samuel 16, 23. I wish I could name some of the choir songs that refresh my spirit. Several of them do. He's still on the throne. It's old-fashioned. It's southern. Praise God. That refreshed my spirit. Then I'll go home and sing it and rejoice as I'm going home. He's still on the throne because it refreshed my spirit. Let me just show you this real quick. Nobody works tomorrow. We're all off, aren't we? No, I'm one kid. 1 Samuel chapter 16. I should have had it marked. It's the most nerve-wracking thing in the world is when you're preaching and you cannot find a verse. It just, it's nervous. But I got it. Here we go. It says, And it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, David took, and what's the next word? Harp. And it played with his hands. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. I don't see a thing about David singing. He's playing. And he's not jamming. And he's not borderline and whirly music. He's playing a harp. We'll all play that in heaven. Amen. We'll be floating around playing harps, I heard. Amen. And in all seriousness, friend, music can refresh your spirit. Music has the power to lift up a fallen spirit and encourage a saddened heart. You ought to thank God you can play anything or sing any song. David's music affected the body, the mind, and the spirit. Refresh, that refers to the physical healing. Was well, look at that, it says it was well. That refers to the emotional healing. And then the evil spirit departed. That, that talks about spiritual healing Amen. through playing one song. Music has the power to do all this. But just as influential as music can be for good, it can also be for bad. Dark, moody, satanic music of the world has the opposite effect upon your body, your mind, and your spirit. You drop your guard. Say amen, Brother Larry. You drop your guard towards drugs. You drop your guard towards sex. You drop your guard towards being rebellious because half the rock songs are preaching rebellion. Yeah. 
they experimented recently with the right kind of music and the wrong kind of music with babies in the womb. And you would not believe the difference. And then last but not least, our music should be doctrinally sound and we'll, we'll, we'll take that up later. But you know it ought to be biblical. It ought to be spiritual. And if it's not scriptural, it's not spiritual. So when people start singing unscriptural songs, I don't care what kind of music or what kind of church they're in, it's not of God. It's got to be biblical. So now that I've made you all mad, and I didn't mean to, and some of you are sad because you're going to have to give up a whole lot of expensive CDs in your car if you're going to get right with God. And some of you, I pray, would pray for our music ministry. Pray for Brother Randy and pray for these musicians as they get up and play. And pray that God would be glorified. And pray that the preacher's heart will be prepared to preach. Because he don't have to be distracted by some kind of ungodly music on some ungodly soundtrack by some ungodly guy that wants to make a buck. But some good, wholesome, godly young people playing their instruments unto the Lord. And then when I get up, my heart is prepared to preach. And yes, your heart is prepared to listen because we've all worshiped together with godly music. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this church. I'm not complaining and I'm not trying to correct anything. Some people are critical but they'd never be satisfied if they were in heaven. But God, I'm going to tell you this, Lord, I appreciate our musicians. And I appreciate our song leader. I appreciate our choir. And I appreciate those that have a taste of music. Might not be just like mine. I might like a banjo, and they don't like a banjo. But Lord, we can agree on what's important, and that's the spirit and the melody and the purpose and the testimony not only the, what is sung, but why it's sung, and why it's played, and how it's played. Not to show off, and not to become a celebrity, but to worship you and the beauty of holiness.